Welcome back to our annual plan meeting. The bad news is Mr. Weatherall's time is already up. Uh, we're starting our second day with presentations from the community boards. And uh, welcome, Mr. Weatherall, uh, from uh, Saddle Hill. Do you have a presentation for us? Welcome. Oh, nice one. Welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, just a note, uh, five minutes is quite a quick time. Uh, so we'll whip through this. Uh, the first part of our presentation purely is some projects that we'd like the council to consider moving forward. Um, obviously there's a lot of information on there, but pretty much uh, if you can think you're heading out um, past Waldronville and you're heading towards Westwood uh, at the Kaikara Estuary, there's a small car park there. And we just, um, we've got some really great feedback from the community that's really well used and we'd just like to extend that and um, regravel it, tidy it up so a lot of people can use it. Um, uh, Blackhead Road footpath, so this is a project we've been working with the council for a long time, acknowledging it is uh, outside the board area, but the reality is it's a really heavily used area and um, often if anyone's had the opportunity to drive down there you'll see a lot of tourists walking down the middle of the road because there's no fixed pedestrian uh, pathway. <clears throat> uh, council are working pretty hard to uh, get um, cooperation from landowners and I think we're all pretty much over the line bar one, which is really great. Um, hey, look, we, we all like uh, cycling and running and walking and things like that, and we're no different out on the coast. Uh, we've got a small stretch there that pretty much is completely inaccessible to, to walk or run on that white line because there is no margin outside of that. So we just asked the council to uh, just uh, widen that shoulder slightly and really for a pretty a small expense, um, and that's quoted by... Um, Richard Saunders um, retired, um, that could be, could be made very, very easily. Um, I guess just an advocacy role, you know, uh, the Saddle Hill Community Board will continue to uh, fight for the reintroduction of extension of rural roads. Um, we've got a number of roads there, McMaster Road is shown there, which is actually used quite uh, routinely in any civil defence or emergencies uh, or any uh, road closures. Uh, along with that, we've got Chain Hills Road and Green Island Bush Road are heavily used, uh, significant developments up in that area. Uh, Smooth Hill, uh, we've got some questions, the community have got questions, and uh, we're just looking forward to the consultation. Um, I guess on behalf of the community, we just asked for that. Uh, there's yeah, there's a pretty, a pretty clear and obvious questions for us on behalf of the community board. Um, before there should be any uh, further uh, development or agreements to this site. Uh, the reality is this site was uh, decided 30 years ago and it made sense back then maybe, uh, but it uh, doesn't necessarily make sense 30 years on and we just ask the council to consider other options. Uh, freedom camping for the, for the for the majority works very well for us. That's about a direct, um, strong focus and collaboration with staff, and which is something that we'll continue to do. We advocate on behalf of the community that these sites should be well maintained, and they are for the majority, uh, well managed, they are for the majority, and we applaud the council for uh, the cooperative um, approach with DOC uh, in the community ranger space. Uh, coastal erosion, nothing new for us. We've been coming to the council for 12 years now asking for a, um, a collaborative ap approach to coastal erosion. We know there's a significant work being done at the Ocean Beach Reserve, but um, the whole of our area is bordered by uh, the coastal. Uh, these are two sites. Um, the one with the cones has just had a significant spend, I don't know how much, uh, by council because the reality is our road was slipping into the beach. And this was something that we raised over six to eight years ago. Um, we think, you know, uh, a wee bit of prevention might just um, save any significant infrastructural damage. On behalf of the community, uh, we're happy to um, take any questions. Um, but we just uh, I guess acknowledge the council for the work they do, the job you do, as well as the, the staff. Uh, you know, for the majority, we work really well and positively with the staff, which is something we we're, we're pretty proud of. Um, don't get me wrong; we we enjoy a good challenge and we enjoy a good discussion. And um, you know, on behalf of the community, we really don't ask too much. I don't think we just want roads that are, are well maintained. We want footpaths. We want trimming of vegetation, and we want rubbish to be picked up on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions?
Mr. Wiley, Councillor Wiley, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, Scott, in that last um, image there, you've got uh, sports fields, um, Brighton Domain, Fairfield. Um, you've been on record as uh, being quite frustrated with some of the upkeep of the sports fields. Uh, are we on the right track in that area? I think so, uh, Councillor Wiley. It's um, you know the, the staff worked pretty hard in that space, and, and that you know we, we don't apologise for advocating on, on that area. But um, yep, no, there's some, been some good maintenance done. Uh, not significant infrastructural uh, change there at the Brighton domain, um, but there's been uh, an increased level of maintenance, which is what we're asking for. Uh, Councillor Lopisol. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, um, gentlemen, for your presentation and your time and energy and your commitment to your community. Um, I noticed that you, you said something about Smooth Hill and that you don't necessarily think it's a good idea now as a, a landfill site. Can you please outline your reasons? Yeah, sure. So the reality is uh, we don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. We just we just would ask the council to ask the questions. Um, is it the, the best site? Uh, have we taken into consideration some of the factors around it that we've got an international airport? I know there's, there's some thoughts and philosophies that it's going to be a bird-free uh, rubbish tip. I look forward to seeing that. Um, that um, the reality is it doesn't make sense to put a tip at the top of a hill. I had the privilege of speaking to Councillor Hall about this and um, because stuff goes down. I know there's going to be some linings, but at the bottom of that hill, do you know what it is? The Brighton Beach. That's a really great uh, recreational space for us and I just ask the Council to consider that before you move forward. Councillor Lord. Yes, yeah, Scott, I just... Um, <coughs> just uh, Oh, sorry. Um, in, in your whole area that your board covers, has there been, um, I know in previous um, annual plans you've asked for footpaths and that sort of things, but would you say th through that whole Waldenville, um, Brighton, that whole area there's more people living there? Is that, is that uh, there seem to be more people building and living? I just know there's quite a few new homes. Is that the case? Uh, yeah, it's definitely out the Brighton area. There's a lot, of, a lot of new builds being built in there, so there's a lot of need for um, a lot of general infrastructure update, really. Um, roads, streets. So are you noticing the roads are busier at peak times in the mornings and the evenings after school, that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely, and including with Freedom Campers coming yeah. and going as well. Yeah. So. You haven't mentioned them, they're not causing any problems? Uh, oh, Scott might be a better one to answer that. But. Uh, I just acknowledged in the presentation, uh, Councillor Lord, that for the majority we work uh, really closely with the community and advocate on behalf of them what the wishes are of the community. And, and in the past we've looked to potentially extend the sites, but we were really clearly uh, communicated with by the community that we've got enough. We think we're doing well over and above what uh, what we can. Um, but, but we're happy. We're happy at the moment. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Scott. Um, my interest is, um, you're talking about a shared cycleway footpath um, along the coast there and up to Tunnel Beach. What do you see the potential for that across a number of areas? Um, well, pretty much, so uh, Blackhead Road, we're, we're communicating, we just need a safe pedestrian space because at the moment we've got uh, a lot of tourists walking down the middle, so that's, that's something. Uh, and the reality is we've, we've fought for uh, about 12 years to have a cycleway uh, throughout the, the uh, pretty much the southern scenic route, uh, so from Green Island through to Torrey Mouth. We've been pretty much communicated that's not going to happen. Um, there is some provision with the Heartland Fund uh, that we could put a, a shoulder on there, but it's not going to be dedicated as cycleway. Um, so, hey, look, anything's better than nothing. And in the last year, we worked with transportation to uh, just get some signage up, you know. So it's about, oh. hey, look, we, we know that uh, we're not the peninsula. Uh, we can't spend multi-million dollars. But that's not what we're asking for. It's just something that's safe. Um, do you see the potential of people biking to work as well? Oh, work, recreation. Uh, hey, look, we've got a huge amount of people that come and enjoy our space, and, and we love that, and we just want to make it a safe space for everybody to enjoy. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, with your number one, I noticed that safety is quite a concern with that Tunnel Beach walkway. Uh, similarly, the Kaikoura Valley car park, I noticed, the Kaikoura Estuary car park, I noticed on Sunday, 
I popped in there for a look and it was chock full and there was a lot of cars, quite a number of cars on the road, which is quite a busy, fast road outside there. So would you say that safety of the public parking at that car park is a significant concern for you, for the community board? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, like I say, we don't ask for too much, but um, being in a safe community is probably right up there. And what does that look like? Yeah, safe roads, safe footpaths, safe pedestrian movements getting rubbish picked up and, and, and safe roads in. Yeah, so fixing that car park would be a significant uh, improvement. Yeah, something. absolutely. And it was something that was directly brought to the board by uh, by members of the community, which is which is great. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, Scott, um, for your amazing advocacy over the years on behalf of, of your community. Um, mine's also a question around cycling. I think it might have been slide three, and forgive me, I couldn't read many of the slides, partly because the font is too small and uh, I'm going blind. Um, it was about that strip uh, for cycling. So the question is, um, obviously looking at that, um, that, that, I mean, that's use, useless in terms of cycling. So are staff cognizant of that situation? And if so, how long have they been cognizant? And are, are you aware of any action being taken? Yeah, hey, look, we were um, you know, working with, this, uh, with um, Richard Saunders. Yeah, so he, he was well aware. There was a reseal that's gone through there just not too long ago, which we hope there might have been a provision just to extend that shoulder slightly. There's been some provisional discussions with the Department of Conservation because they actually own just off the road, which they've indicated no issues there at all. So a collaborative approach, I think we can get it done. And it's only um, probably just only a couple of hundred metres, isn't it? Yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, so connecting Westwood to Ocean View, that's right. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my question actually is, is, is back to Smooth Hill. Um, Christchurch has their um, facility at Cape Valley, um, which is in coastal hills just to the north of Christchurch, um, almost very similar, um, and is bird-free, um, works very well as bird-free. So would the community board, when we go through the consultation process, would you like to go up and see it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've we've been acknowledged as a significant stakeholder uh, in the, some documentation, but to date we've been asking for information rather than it coming freely to us. So we acknowledge it's outside of our board area, but it certainly directly affects a lot of our residents. And okay. hence we're happy to ask the questions and advocate. Excellent, thanks. There's nothing more local government than a landfill tour. Councillor Barker. Um, may I just ask, you mentioned Tunnel Beach there, and I see that uh, the city promotes it quite a lot. Have you got an estimate of how much the visitation's grown there? Oh, I would not know, Councillor. From what I see on social media, etc., it's, it's mm. quite huge. Are there any other issues apart from the parking and the safe walking, like um, toilets, which is often comes up? Is there necessity for loos and signage and more infrastructure there? Yeah, so I, um, I'm aware that there's been some changes in ownership of property up there and that there's some discussions with Council and Department of Conservation to extend the car park, tidy it all up, make a safe access. But hey, look, uh, not having a toilet doesn't make sense. Um, but we're pretty good at that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's got to it's be there because um, it's a long walk down, it's a bigger walk up, and somebody's got to go to the toilet at some stage. Yeah, toilet and um, safe car parking makes pure sense. Obviously, management around Freedom Camping, if when we tidy up that car park, something we've got to be mindful of as well, so. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Wiley, I'll indulge you, sir. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Scott, I just want to congratulate you and your father on a great Brighton Gala Day um, on the weekend on Sunday. Uh, also good, the TCC staff seem to get good engagement, so the community board uh, tent. Um, what is the date next year? And I'd invite all councillors to come and see one of the best events in town. Excellent question. And it's free. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Wiley. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great community event. That's what it's all about. Um, put on for the community, by the community. And uh, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge team of people that, that make it happen for sure. But we also get uh, huge support from the Dunedin City Council events team and also Parks and Reserves team from you know tidying up the access ways, pathways through the community uh, for our big day out in the sun. Um, yeah, I mean, some people had some complaints. There wasn't enough shade, but. Um, if you can complain about that, Dunedin, it's, it's not too bad. Oh, I'll be the last Sunday of January. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Ms. Davis.
Well, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Mosgiltari Community Board. Um, it is a real privilege to represent the people out there. Um, our board doesn't meet till next week, so it hasn't had time to consider positions for this meeting. However, um, we will be looking at our 2020 priorities as we get together for our community plan and engagement on that. Um, I'd like, though, to celebrate some of the successes and ongoing work achieved through the positive engagement with DCC teams and the board. Um, in doing so, though, I'd urge you to reflect on these successes and the needs that we're placing before you as I speak to them and where best we might allocate resources to them. So social wellbeing is a key strategy covering many, many areas and the place-based funding initiative saw three community groups with the board's backing succeed in gaining three-year funding for a Mosgill-based project. This provided staffing of 30 hours per week the Encouraging Safety Project has, through its events and educational programs over the past year, helped our community become more informed, better connected and, crucially, more resilient. So this year we're looking forward to working with the DCC Community Development Team as we plan our community survey and continue with community events such as Neighbours Day and the Midwinter Lunches and things like that. Um, Place-based funding has been a massive boost and it's vital for community builders, then certainly delivers bang for the ratepayers' buck, and it must continue. In terms of connecting, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Mosgill Library staff for the outstanding work they do in developing community-facing programs. We appreciate the work that's been done on the building there to make it more comfortable for everybody. Um, they are an amazing source of information and are always looking to do something a bit different in, in a way to connect with the wider community. In the area of transport, the Safer Access Ways teams have come up with excellent proposals to help quieten down busy streets and make them safer for our young people and our older people to walk around the town. They're always positive and enthusiastic. The board and the Encouraging Safety Project team look forward to working alongside them again this year and there is certainly plenty to tackle. An integrated transport strategy has been a key priority for the Mosgiltari Community Board. Many in our community feedback positively when asked last year about the proposed cooperation with ORC, cheaper bus fares and a free inner city bus loop. An integrated cycle network is certainly still on many people's radar, as are the seemingly endless amounts of trucks travelling down Gordon Road lately joined by tour buses. This is not safe at all for our vulnerable pedestrians, young or old. Pride in Our Place was a project championed by the Mosgiltari Community Board and is ongoing. Waste and Environmental Solutions, the comms team and others have been working hard to help the board get the upcoming Hawk and Hurl recycling event over the line. We look forward to make it, making, um, uh, more working with them on other ventures. And then, of course, we've got the big one, the Molesgill Aquatic Centre. It's moving forward at last. Good things, it would appear, do indeed take time. We look forward to the ground being broken and having a completion date for what will be an excellent city amenity. Many people from all over our city will no doubt want to come over the hill and use it, and this will add vibrancy to our area. Water, of course, when not contained, can be a challenge for those living on the Tyree. I've served three years on the board to date and have been called out for flooding emergencies every year. Thankfully, not last winter. Flood mitigation is ongoing and we look forward to the work that's going to be happening around the Reed Avenue and Carlisle Road pumps. Mosgill Tari community board members hear a lot from our community in regard to concerns over the growth in our area and the associated challenges around infrastructure. We have advocated for capacity issues to be addressed and for growing links between ORC and DCC to continue. Thanks to the Three Waters team for their excellent communication with us and we look forward to that continuing and the steady progress to, to be made. These are just some of the opportunities and challenges along with the many initiatives and smaller projects that the board carries out that I do not have time to mention today. As Scott said, five minutes isn't very long but we do appreciate the time. Growth which is planned for and resourced appropriately, managed well, allows for every resident to access services to be better connected, safer, happier and resilient. And as we head into this year, the Mosgiltari Community Board will continue to look and listen 
to support and encourage and to advocate on behalf of our ever-increasing number of residents. We look forward to working positively for the good of all in our city. Kia ora, Joy. Thank you for your uh, reflections and we look forward to hearing the Board's priorities um, presented through the annual plan process once you've had a chance to consider them formally. I appreciate the timing doesn't work for everyone. Are you happy to take questions? If I'll do my any? best. Questions? Councillors? Councillor Walker? Um, thank you, Joy, for, for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned during your presentation a uh, desire to see um, cycleways progressed. Yes. Uh, could you just give a sort of... Uh, just an overview of what the priorities in that area would be? Well, I mean, if we can get them all integrated and linked up, it's going to be better for the whole community. It's going to, it's going to help our business. It's going to give a recreational opportunity that isn't currently there. We've got lots of flat land in and around the area, and I'm sure it would extend out as well. So it's got to be good for the whole community to um, integrate the whole lot. Councillor Officer. Um, thank you very much, um, Ms. Davis, for your presentation and your commitment to your community and the well-being of, of the people at Mosgill um, East Tyree. I mean Tyree. Um, you talked about um, flooding emergencies and mitigation. And, and does the community board has the community board taken the time or had the time to talk about um, the future in terms of? Um, climate change and and how the people of Mosgill, the community of Mosgill is dealing, going to deal with that in the long term? It isn't something we've sat down and really addressed, no, but it's, it's a very uh, well-made point, Councillor. Mm. The question is, I, I know it's in past presentations you've talked about um, the well-being of young people in Mosgill, so how, how, are you, how do you think the community board's managing um, again, strategic thinking in terms of the future of young I people. think we need to develop a better connection with the college. It's one of the biggest colleges around. We do have good connections with the principal there. Um, we do have good connections with the Youth East Tyree uh, uh, people and their um, work in the college and around. And we also work well with the primary school principals. Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship. Joy, thanks for your presentation. You mentioned the heavy traffic on Gordon Road. Mm. Um, and before I was on council, there was obviously talk of, of developing a heavy traffic bypass near Rickerton Road. Do you think it's time to re revisit that again? Because we're not going to get rid of that heavy traffic. Well, we recognise what a challenge it is with it being a state highway and a railway line at the other end and all those other complications. There's so many agencies that need to be considered in this. But um, it definitely is becoming worse, I think. Um, it's quite unsafe at times on that main road. Mm, thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Joy, for your presentation. I was just um, wondering, the track from um, Waihola to Lawrence has been, um, you know, um, said yes to, and just wondering about the tourism potential of mm -hmm. getting the Waihola to Dunedin, which links into um, Steve's mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. What what are um, Mosgiel's thoughts on that? Well, we're very keen for that to happen, and I know there are groups of people in Mosgiel who are actively advocating for that and, and looking to do some serious lobbying in, in a separate area altogether. Uh, I mean, they, they've talked to the board that they are actually putting some work into this and wanting to become... Um, a separate entity that would lobby for that and they would have to be happy to work with us. So we definitely would back that. So the potential, say, for cyclists to come from the airport as well through Mosgill? Well, yes, anything that... Um, I mean, it's got to be good. We've, we've still got a few um, spaces in our main street and a roundabout that could easily be turned into some kind of uh, business or support for cycling. Um, there's plenty of opportunity there for growth. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Mr. Pope.
once again uh, representing uh, the Otago Peninsula Community Board in five minutes. We should have Pecha Kucha instead for, for annual plan, perhaps, instead. Uh, what's happening here? So, here we go. So, um, obviously, um, yeah, we have worked very hard over the last few years with council and council staff. Um, and I think one of the things that comes through from all the board presentations is the positivity that we have with council and, and with council staff. We've been actively canvassing our um, community for some time over its aspirations and its needs, um, and that will continue uh, between now and actually the, the, fight, the annual plan with clinics and workshops. We have a biodiversity forum and an operators forum with tourism uh, operators as well, um, and that will give us the opportunity for some further refinement uh, as well. So we want to be a connected city. Obviously, uh, at the moment, um, the men and women of Fulton Hogan are chomping away at, uh, at our road, roadworks at the moment, um, and it is a matter of urgency to see that continue, uh, particularly uh, with the removal of the Otako Harrington Point section, which was taken out as part of the budget, and uh, we would like to see that put back, and certainly so would the Otako Harrington Point community, and you can actually see that top photo uh, of the slide is that area there. Um, the other one is the reconfiguration of the Weir Road section, which was built, but it actually wasn't built to standard. So, um, and in fact, the uh, concrete barriers need to be moved in a metre and the extra cycle lane created because that would mean that the whole design from Dunedin to Otako would all be the same rather than having it different. Um, and something that we've talked about before, but the, obviously the consultation, implementation of bilingual place name signage uh, on the Otago Peninsula, which is important to Te Runaka Otako, but also um, the idea of having, uh, working with the Regional Council to having uh, bilingual signage for bus stops in the Tongapahi. Um, we have three key pedestrian residential safety projects in our area. The first is McAndrew Bay. With the use of the beach, the position of public facilities and the access of the road, we do need an improvement in the ability to actually cross the road safely in that particular area. And while some work has been done on it, it needs a much wider scope to, uh, to improve that for our school kids, for our visitors and the like. Pukaheke, we've seen a huge increase in traffic volume over the last few years, um, both for its scenic qualities but also for its ease of access. Um, and speed, the lack of pedestrian facilities has made this area a high priority for this part of the community. Tomahawk Road, uh, we now have a consent, for, there is now a consent for a 90 uh, lot subdivision of which 48 lots are to be built, are being built at present. Um, we have been asking now for three years of council for improvements uh, and reduction in speed uh, on the Tomahawk Road. Uh, there have been a number of accidents, there's also been some poor behaviour there in those areas over a number of years. Council did begin a process but we'd like to see that finished. Um, drainage, footpaths uh, right across the residential areas of all the um, Otago Peninsula are a major um, concern for us, uh, particularly over wet weather and uh, with the effects of sea level rise and the increase of uh, rain. Uh, the investigation into the sealing of gravel roads in the back bays is something that also, while our um, rural roads are relatively small, they're extremely well used. Uh, the other is the investigation and preparation of plans for the raising of the Back Bay roads in preparation for the effects of sea level rise and the, ultimately the development of a catchment and geotechnical reporting program to safeguard and predict future issues of, of, of weather events and climate change. Yellow eye penguins on the Otago Peninsula are actually in crisis for a range of reasons. The probability that they may be extinct on the mainland is very real. The Otago Peninsula needs far greater collaborative funding for biodiversity, habitat restoration, science and pest control. Coastal dune protection, just as um, Mr Weatherall raised, is also another area that we need to deal with. Te Rione, Smales Beach, Tomahawk and Okia beaches are all very important as from that perspective. I raised this last time and I'll raise it again that the planting of 100,000 trees and plants on the council-owned reserves over the next 10 years would actually help to support the efforts for biodiversity in our area but also mitigate the effects of tourism and air travel. The board notes the recent Ministry for the Environment report on the impact of plastic on marine ecosystems, Pilots Beach particular. 
There are 15 items of rubbish every 100 square metres of beach, of which 23% is hard plastics and 23% are food wrappers. We seek trials on stormwater filters in conjunction with the regional councils to stop plastic entering the harbour, better rubbish bins, better advertising and increased fundings for cleanups and enforcement. We cannot continue to rely on the goodwill of volunteers to do this. We actually need to take action uh, around our infrastructure as one part of this. We need investment in tourism search to ensure a better understanding of the industry, its in environmental and economic impacts on the Otago Peninsula. That investment would pay dividends in sound decision making over infrastructure and marketing projects initiatives, which could include a longitudinal tourism studies developed through intern partnerships with the University of Otago and the Otago Polytech, and also include grants to organisations and businesses undertaking research in the sector. Our track network, I've raised this again, but to be honest, we have a world-class track network on the Otago Peninsula, which actually has huge potential, not only for community wellness, but also for the potential for tourism, recreation and conservation. It has not been maintained or had any capital upgrade in it since the early 1990s, and we are in desperate need to see this work actually undertake and become part of the wider council program. And finally, if I can get the slide to go, Healthy city, we need, uh, we'd like to see the installation of public toilets, Tomahawk Beach, and the upgrade of public toilets at McAndrew Bay. And the last thing really is that um, we recognise that the increase of $500 per annum for power prices through your company, Aurora, is going to cause significant hardship for some people in our community. And I ask you as councillors to take control of that situation to ensure that it delivers economically viable services to our customers. Otherwise, there are people in our community on the peninsula who will be cold this winter. Thank you very much. Yeah, kia ora, Paul, and uh, thank you for your ongoing uh, support in managing expectations and frustrations around uh, the transport work that is being done on the <laughs> peninsula. It's very helpful. Um, I have a question just on that around Highcliffe Road. Is it your sense that the increased traffic volumes are being driven to some degree, no pun intended, by people trying to avoid that work and that it, it, would, it would revert yeah. back to something like it used to be? There is that, and council staff, to be fair, have made a fantastic job with the works around slip and other safety works there um, over recent years. I mean, we, we faced a situation where that road was closed for nearly 18 months, and with the money that was put into that road, we now have a safeguarded and alternate route. Um, my point on this is probably it's partly driven by the tourism sector um, and people visiting areas and that sort of thing. Um, I think some of that volume might decrease once that road, the road, bottom road is finished, but it still leaves us with situations where Pukahiki has uh, people coming through driving at ridiculous speeds, uh, there is no areas for people to walk and that kind of thing. So. It's not a huge project. Um, one of the things that we would really love to see is just simple arrows, directional arrows pointed to keep people on their side of the lane uh, as well for those people who, um, who decide that they want to live in America and drive on the, on the right. <laughs> Thanks. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just uh, two questions. The first one relates to the issue of speed on the upper road. Uh, do the uh, traffic Constabulary ever do any policing? Yes, we've um, we've we've recently had a new we have a new officer based in uh, Portobello, and uh, he's been quite proactive from that perspective. But he's only one man, I guess, across the whole peninsula. Um, and yeah, so there is that. I I think from an initial point of view, what I, what we'd really like to see is first of all, let's have a look at measuring what that speed is. Let's see what that really, what the issue is and get some real data around that and then see whether there is a solution or whether the, or not it's just a, if it's a real problem. Okay. Um, and also yesterday or the day before, we all received, I think, a, a letter from a Peninsula resident who yes. was extremely grumpy about delays yes. on the Peninsula connection. The previous comment that's been made to us has been how well received that work and how tolerant the community has been in in relation to those delays and improvements. Um, has that changed or is this an, a sort of an outlier, the letter that I'll spare you? I think everyone has family and business pressures, work pressures to get to work at a particular time. 
and uh, we're now beginning the new um, school season. We've all had a holiday and we've been a little bit more relaxed over that period and perhaps um, sometimes um, changes or, or, or the facing of a new year. Um, I would say um, that people have been incredibly, incredibly patient with Fulton Hogan and the council. And as a board, we've been very heavily involved in pushing that message through to people uh, across the community. There will always be some people who want it back to the way it was when it was a 100 kilometre an hour road and that sort of thing. Um, those people usually end up in the harbour. Um, and the ODT take great delight in, um, in printing those photos in the paper, um, much to my um, annoyance. But anyway, but um, I would say, um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of that. I think the announcement of, um, of the Broad Bay section through the media uh, rather than perhaps through the board might have been helpful. We could have softened that a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's, there were reasons for that. Um, and I think it's like anything, you have to, you know, we've got, th we've got three more years of this, that's the reality of it, and the, the contractors have charmed many, many members of the community with their abilities. Um, I think we just have, to, it's just a suck it and see. We're very, very close to that section between Vauxhall and Glenfellow. Once that area is fully sealed and the levels are done, that will mean the drive through from McAndrew Bay will be almost unimpeded. We've also see the Edwards Bay slip. That's very close to being finished. We should see that finished by the end of February. That's going to make a massive difference. And I think if we can just get over this next month, this next six weeks, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to the patience of the people of the peninsula being reflected on the West Harbour over the next few years as similar work is going on on State Highway 88. Um, Councillor Barker. Kia ora, Paul. Um, I just want to ask a couple of questions about, obviously, the tourism on the peninsula. Um, in the 2008 visitor strategy, it was said there was about half a million visitors that came mm -hmm. onto the Otago Peninsula. What do you, how much do you think that volume's increased? Are there any figures on that? No, and that's something, as I say, we, we really need to, you know, as I say, we really need to do some more research on that. I'd like to see that happen, as I say, through partnerships with the university. And, and we've got opportunities here. We've got a, we've got a tourism department in both colleges. Um, and it would be a really good thing, not only for business and business development, particularly for people who are looking to... There will be businesses that start around the road widening. There will be people that are looking for bike hires and courier and all that kind of stuff. So it would be really useful to actually have information that they could use and rent volume that they could use to actually form the, their business plans. Sorry. Am yeah, because I, I drive the um, high road every yeah. week and it is actually quite scary and I feel that there would possibly be um, accidents on that road yes. because there are often people on the wrong side of the road. Yep. And I've also seen a lot of tour buses using that now and I yes. feel that's to avoid the roadworks on the yep. bottom road. But we've had members of our team taking photographs of some quite... Tour buses on the going. high road has been a, quite a recent mm. thing and it's one of the biggest bugbears of, uh, of the local community. The other thing I just wanted to mention was that um, mm. obviously you were talking about Pilot's Beach. Mm. I go down there occasionally and yep. collect plastic. We get about six to seven kilos of plastic off Pilot's Beach um, every week, which is a huge amount, and the penguins are starting to use it in their nests. So I completely yep. um, support what you're saying there. And 14 out of 16 of the last albatross chicks threw up plastic. So it's a big concern that we're looking after the environment. I really liked your idea about planting more trees to mitigate the effects of the tourism volumes. So, um, yeah, so the, the idea of, of, of the plastic thing was, was really to do that initial, those, those big nets as a trial. Mm. Um, our tourism industry on the peninsula is totally reliant on avian biodiversity. Albatrosses, mm. blue penguins, yellow, pe yellow white penguins. So anything related to habitat, uh, predatory behaviour and plastic and sea conditions affects that and affects business and affects biodiversity. So anything we can do to improve that uh, will make a big difference for the birds in the future. Thank you. I just remind people to turn their microphones off when they're not using them. Those of us who still have top end hearing <coughs> Struggling with feedback. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just recently um, did pretty much all the tracks on the wild side of the peninsula, and there was one track called Paradise Track. Now, that's paradise going down, but it's hell going up. <laughs> 
And uh, um, I totoku your thought that as an active city, we need a track that is far easily more accessible to not just tourists, but our own people to see that beautiful wild side. And Banks Peninsula has such a track. So what, what's happening in that space and what's your vision for that? So there's been a major piece of work done by Parks over the condition of the tracks and um, that sits at the moment in council offices and we've yet, I've yet to go and see that. Um, and there is work, ongoing work through the track strategy um, but um, we would like to see that brought up to the forefront. Uh, it, it takes time but as I say, um, because those tracks are important, um, they haven't been maintained or, or managed for a long time. I'm not sure I totally agree with you that we actually need new tracks to make it be make it um, uh, easier. What we needed is the ones that we have maintained and interpreted and promoted, um, because people make choices around recreation. Um, some people will challenge themselves if they're not that fit and challenge themselves and give us something a go. And some people will actually build up um, they build up their fitness, they go, right, I'm going to go and do that Paradise Track and get there. It is 20 kilometres from Tomahawk Beach to Portobello if you walk on tracks. And I've walked it for one day in about seven hours. And it's 10 kilometres from Tomahawk to, Sa to Sandfly Bay. So the network is there. And, of course, take into account that you own the beautiful Hirawika Harbour Cone, uh, which also links up to uh, Broad Bay and, uh, as well. So all those linkages are there, but what we need is a marketable brand and a marketable type of uh, signage that works both with DOC and with landowners and with the council. So it's more about connecting those tracks together? Yeah, connecting them in a way, they're already sort of connected through the landscape, but what we want to do is, you know, rather than having um, some signs which have been out there since 1992. Um, let's have some signs that actually tell people where they're going, what they're seeing, what the history of the area is, who walked on this land, what the plants are, what the animals are. Um, and then hopefully what will happen is people will build businesses, they will hire bikes, they will um, offer courier services, they will take people to a variety of accommodation, just like they have in Banks Peninsula. That's, that's what I'm saying. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Paul. Um, just, I've, you know, this particular exercise, the annual plan and then the long-term plan in the future, is effectively a budgetary exercise, and I have noted that the community plans in the past from the community boards have had trouble integrating into the development of those budgets. So a lot of the stuff that you've asked for, obviously, would require an integration, and I'm looking specifically, let's say, the example you're talking about of of um, reducing plastic infiltration into the harbour through our stormwater system, which would be in line with our um, urban freshwater policies that we're going to have to develop as the ORC develops its. So how is your community board um, coming with this new design that we're having with the attempt to get the community plans to have a structure that they align with the development of the annual plan and, lo and long-term plan budget? One of the things with that is that probably better information for boards around what budgets are and what the standards that are set within those budgets are required. So not only in maintenance but in capital. So, um, and it will take time for boards to realise that coming to the annual plan is not just putting out the begging bowl. It's actually coming here to actually be part of a strategic approach to, fi to finances. That will take some time. On the other side of it, I'm not saying I'm not suggesting that the things or the things that I'm asking for from our board are largely um, uh, out of kilter I don't think with generally the things that the council are doing so it's mainly about nuts and bolts stuff road safety those kinds of things it's how we put it's how eventually the decisions are made around where they sit in the priority so yeah, I, you know, it will take some time to get used to that notion. I'm pleased though that the fact that we are going to be able to do that from that perspective. But like any board uh, chair, I'm always a bit wary um, because at the end of the day, there are pressures on, on you from the community to get things done and to make things happen. So, you know, it's a balancing act, but it will take a little bit of time to get used to it. Councillor Houlihan. 
Kia ora, Paul. Thank you for your presentation. I thought it was really informative. You've thought a lot about the environment and the impact of those things, and not just your community, but you know the extended community as far as the um, biodiversity and the and you know birds and wildlife. Because of course the peninsula is one of our jewels and our tourism crown for our city. And I agree with you. I think it's essential that we put. An investment into that area. I've always, for, I've for a long time, had a concern about that road and thought we should have a, a barrier along it because it's quite dangerous when you're driving. But probably the cycleway has helped that a bit, has it? You know, from a safety point of view. Yes. Yeah, so um, having the the width, the additional width, and the cycleway and the shared pathway has made made a difference. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's not a perfect world, and 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 everyone has a variety of skills in driving. Um, but it, um, but certainly, like I say, it will make a difference. Remembering, of course, councillors, that the Peninsula Project Connection Project was always first and foremost a safety project. That was what it was there for. It was not to design or develop a cycleway. It was there as a safety project based on the analysis of crash test of crash data. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you for letting us know that. I wondered, um, do you have uh, what sort of relationship does the board have with the Marae down there? Our deputy chairman is part of Tarunaka Ataka. Oh, okay. uh, I sit on a number of boards and working parties with members of uh, Otako, and uh, we have a, a, a very good relationship uh, mm -hmm. with them. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all at, uh, at Waitangi a day at uh, Otako Marae. So, uh, yeah, I'll be there. Fabulous. Have you done some collaborative things with the Marae? Is that something that you're looking at in the future or have done? We continue to always do collaborative things with the Marae because the Marae is part of our, our uh, which is one of the reasons why I raised the issue of bilingual signage, mm. uh, because uh, it, it helps to you know add the place names of our of our of our area into mm. the uh, the lexicon of our community. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, Paul, thank you. Um, as with Scott, I just want to thank you um, for your amazing work as a board chair over the years, advocating on behalf of your community also. Um, I don't think that can be understated. I have a couple of questions. The first one, a couple of councillors have touched on it. You mentioned the stormwater filters, and you talked about that in the context of the ORC. Have you spoken to the ORC about that? And if so, what sort of... I'm, uh, I'm, I'm due... I'm due again for their annual plan as well. <laughs> um, but the fact, I will ask the same question. I guess what I'm asking for is, is there a, is there a partnership relationship that can be made uh, given the regional council's importance that has management of the harbour? And is that something that can also be worked in with infrastructure that the council manage at the same time? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not asking for it to be done on every drain, but let's start with somewhere and let's see if it works. Uh, thank you, great idea. Um, second question is around freedom cam camping. You didn't mention freedom camping and in previous presentations you've had. Can I assume, therefore, that the work that staff have done in collaboration with the community board has had uh, outcomes that you would describe as favourable related to perceived problems from freedom camping? The bylaw on the Otago Peninsula differs slightly from the wider city in as much as that uh, residential areas of the Otago Peninsula are freedom camping free zones. Um, we still have some concerns over freedom camping areas, and there are still some hot spots, but we deal with those through staff uh, reasonably well. There are infrastructural issues, particularly with the Department of Conservation and, uh, and, and the DCC, mainly the, D, the, mainly the department, to deal with in places like San, Sandfly Bay and Sandy Mount. They have put temporary toilets there. That's been a bonus. Um, as I say, our approach to freedom camping in terms of the bylaw has been quite different, and that's been a reaction by the community to the um, to the trial that was undertaken uh, at McAndrew Bay some years ago. So there, but um, you know, it's an ongoing thing, and uh, we'll just uh, we always just uh, take it as it comes. <laughs> I didn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I just had a, <coughs> not a question that you partially answered when you were referring to um, Councillor Barker, but it was just the, is there a risk on the peninsula, and I think of the yellow-eyed penguins and the stress they're clearly under, is there a risk that the sheer numbers of tourists is going to compound the problem? 
That's a really difficult question to know, and it's just why the reason I raised the issue around having really good economic and environmental research done on the, uh, on the impact of tourism on the peninsula and what the levels of load can actually be taken. Um, on that, um, you know, one of the other issues apart from tourism is actually about habitat loss, it's also about climate change and it's about um, sea level rise and, and the warming of seas and the acidification. That's clearly interrupted food feeding patterns of the birds over recent years and will continue to do so if we don't mitigate those effects. So um, the short answer to that is I can't say what the level will be that it will affect. Um, the fact is that some of the tourism operators who operate very good um, animal wildlife um, opportunities take those things into account, but without good research, I can't give you a, a affirmative answer to that. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. In your presentation, Paul, you mentioned desire to upgrade the toilets at Mac Bay. Um, are you talking about um, in the current location in the front of the hall or, you, um, or as a standalone um, facility well, desired? Well, it's an opportunity cost, cost question, that. Give us a new crossing point and engineer a new crossing point so that people can cross the road to the newly established, newly developed toilets at the McAndrew Bay Hall or look at the op options of redeveloping a set of toilets closer to the beach. Okay. So, that's, so that is a strategic question, and I guess that comes back to where um, Jim O'Malley was saying, we need to think about that strategically in terms of those opportunity cost questions. And you're having that discussion with staff? We've, we've started that. Um, toilets is such a terrible thing to be discussing with staff, there's better things to do, but unfortunately it's probably one of the hottest topics. We need a, we need a sort of Department of Toilets in the, uh, in the Council. Yeah. <laughs> Minister of Toilets. The Toilet Czar. Thank you, Mr Pope. <laughs> On that ignominious note, thank you. <laughs> Representing the hinterlands, Mr Williams. Welcome, Barry. Thank you very much. Just chuck your microphone on there, if you would. That better? Um, oh, just a big thank you to the council, previous council, and the present one, and the staff for the speed that we got the bridge over the Sutton River. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, and also the working in with the council on the weight of materials off the bridge that we've been able to utilised for different projects and fundraising. So, huge thank you to that. And well led by Cecil, obviously him plus other guys, but very, very much appreciated. Contrary to that, there is another creek around the road a bit further that washed away at practically the same time, and council were excellent at getting it up and going again, but it did cut the gap for the water to go through, and there was a potential huge flood which will wet one poor fella's house and feet. But I understand Sue had a look at it and um, things are moving, so you just keep that going. The only things we ask for, well, a few things, but just want to keep the, the maintenance perhaps up a bit. I think it, I felt it's dropped in the last few years. The weed spraying, the shingle gravelling and grading uh, spasmodically, but I understand there might be another contractor coming, so just... It's quite sad when the, the noxious weeds and that get knocked well back and then the, in the last couple of years you see them increasing again and the previous ones had to put a dye in it so you could complain that they hadn't been done but it's pretty hard when there's no dye that they may have just done it. So, But uh, one of the major ones we've got now is a bolt out of the blue and I'd like to thank Sue and Aaron previously when they had a meeting with Tyree Gorge. They're going to discontinue Pukarangi to Middlemarch. Um, bolt out of the blue for us. Um, they cite, you know, dollars and all that. Um, I don't think they'd even consulted council, which I felt was disgraceful. We had them up at community board meeting last week and have organised a public meeting on the 27th of February at the local hall, so I anticipate quite a bit of feeling from, from the locals. Um, I know there'll be a handful say, oh, good, get rid of it, we can ride the bike there, but be like your 
cable cars, once they're gone, you'll never get it back. And I just hope the council can support us. If it were just a dollar for the gate, we wouldn't have a library, we wouldn't have museums, pools or anything. So and credit to Sue that, and you, Aaron, you got on the board pretty quick when you finally heard it and um, it certainly delayed some things. So we just seek, as a community, in a wider community, um, seek your support to do whatever we can do. Um, project STEAM of moving a bit of gear up there, and I don't know whether it's a thought that if the rails do go, they'll never be able to shift it, but um, we just want to see things stay the way they are and happen. Um, just a bit joy before, talking about Gordon Road, I think if Rickerton Road was a bit tidier as an outward person, you know, from a different community board, would be take a hell of a lot of strain and stress off your Gordon Road in the Mosgill town. It's probably the one of the worst roads that I drive on regularly, uh, as far as roughness, and stupidly people either walking, running, or riding a bike down there. It's very, very narrow, and I can understand why the logging trucks won't use it if people are going to be stupid enough to run and ride down there. There's, there's just no room. So I, I think if that were done, that would help, which probably helps our area too. But, um, yeah, there's a bit of probably new, new guys, a couple of new ones on the community board, so, you know, they're enthusiastic, and I think things will go forward. But, yeah, we don't really ask for too much up there, but when we do, we hope that it does happen. Thanks, Barry. Are you happy to take questions? Certainly. Oh, yeah, I'm very pleased that we have got a council rep, even though he had to plug it himself. <laughs> we, we're used to it, don't worry. <laughs> Councillor O'Malley. <coughs> hey, Barry. Um, your comments about the weed spraying and other such things, um, with this redesigning of the community plans and how they interface with the council, I mean, would you consider that maybe what in your community plan you'd ask for an increase in the service level funding? I mean, that potentially could be the mechanism by which you get that question through. Yeah, Jim, that probably is the answer, but, and I know it depends on season, so whatever budget you have, if you've got a wet year, things grow yeah. and, and strip away a lot, a lot better. So it's just that hands-on thing. Mm -hmm. You know, things have improved. We've got um, the grass up there's being cut by locals operating the machine, so we're getting a far better service on that. Uh, and, and probably, a, I won't say it's a lesser cost for the council, but um, it seems to be working well. It gets well, cut when it needs cut. That too can be a community plan submission, that, that we do contracts to locals rather than to other groups, you know, externally. You know, I, I am aware that, you know, some of it's led to State Highway, 87, but then we've also got the council roads as well. Um, now you mentioned Rickon Road again. Um, the problem, I mean, the challenge you do whenever you do a traffic movement is obviously while some people see less heavy traffic outside their house, the other people on that other road are going to see more traffic outside their house. And I, from what I recollect, that was the issue when Rickon Road was brought up last time, is that the people on Rickon Road who obviously didn't want to see that heavy <laughs> traffic coming it, out. It, it has been for many, many years, and Brian probably has led that one, or still leads it. Um, but it is extremely rough. Councillor Lord. Yeah, Barry, look, um, I think it was probably about this time last year when they started putting all the, the yellow lines on State Highway 87 and suddenly taking away all the places to pass when you're going up the hill. Um, is that, I mean, obviously it hasn't changed, they haven't taken them away, but is that eased down, settled down, or are people just overtaking on the double yellow lines, or how are we doing it? I think there's a bit of that happening. Uh, the, the milk tankers are probably the main ones, but they're very courteous, and, and so is their local transports, and, and do duck over and indicate where people can go. So, yeah, it's still, I think, they just went yellow paint crazy, really, to be fair. It's, it's, it's very hard. I mean, it would be nice if there was a couple of perhaps passing bays um, down near a, the deep stream, or deep stream up the top there. It's a good one on going down the hill. So, yeah, just some of that would help. Councillor Elder. Um, I pop out to my board at least every now and then. Even though this isn't working. Here we go. Um, and park in the main street, and I cross the main street. And one of the things I see is all those big trucks going through. And I think of little children or older people who can't 
or people with disability who, who can't move so fast. And I think, to me, it seems like um, the heavy traffic going through Mosgiel is actually a safety issue. Would you be, would, would you think that was true? Oh, yeah, well, I probably shouldn't be talking on Mosgiel because I'm middle march, but um, <clears throat> the trucks do pay a s substantial amount of money to use the road. Uh, and, and I don't agree. They should all be through the main street of Mosgiel, but I wouldn't, if I had a truck, I wouldn't be driving down Rickett and Road. It's too rough, which could avert a bit from the township, town. Council on Officer. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr Williams, um, for your presentation uh, and time. Um, I'm just curious about um, board funding, the $10,000 that you get to allocate. Do you, do you, can you just, forgive me, my ignorance, but do, what kinds of things, um, projects are funded by, by your board? Uh, generally community-based groups. Uh, could be swimming pools or that used by, we did give some money recently to Project STEAM, the medical centre, we've got a, a local house of our own up there that we've assisted with fencing. Um, it maintains itself pretty well with rentals, but the little extra things, we've, we use our funding for that. And just in terms of um, strategic future thinking for the council and everyone, would you, if if there was to be an increase of, of that amount, would would you have problems spending it or? I haven't never seen anyone trouble spending money. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is just a sort of a general ballpark figure as as to what, if there was to be an increase, what priorities would would the board um, look at and? What would you what might you suggest to funders here? Um, how that could be probably implement registration of push bikes. <laughs> no, seriously, we we have no trouble. The community groups do apply for quite a bit more than we ever distribute, and um, we do try and share it around. If I've got a grant this year, they don't get one next year, type of thing. Even though the project may be worthy of it. And on that almost nostalgic note, uh, we seem to have come to the end of questions, Mr. Williams. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much Appreciate for it. Reading, listening to us. Thank you. Ms. Griffin. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today. I'm a, excuse me if I'm a little bit nervous. I've usually got a guitar on when I'm speaking to this many people. Um, I'm here representing the West Harbour Community Board. Uh, we don't have our um, next meeting until next week, so I'm just giving an overview of things we'd like and things we've had. First, I'd like to uh, just say thank you very much to uh, council and council staff for, um, for starters, for the work with sycamores uh, along the West Harbour uh, corridor, I guess you'd call it, and up the hill above Port Chalmers, and may it long continue. There's lots more there that need to be dealt with. Uh, thank you very much uh, for last year's uh, support of a reduction of the speed limit on George Street uh, to 30 kilometres. We still await uh, not quite with bated breath because we'd be dead, uh, NZTA for uh, what they're going to do. Hopefully they'll do 30 k's. Uh, also, <clears throat> there's been a really gnarly drainage issue in Harrington Street. It's great to see council, still, council staff still working diligently at that. I understand that it's a very, very costly process, but completely necessary. Um, also, the work with the beaches by law, which is... Uh, <clears throat> proving to be just a little bit gnarly, but we'll all get there, I'm sure. Uh, so, the our one of our main focus uh, with with the our plan this year, and that we'll present in a much more comprehensive way in May June, <clears throat> when the hearings are, is we really like to see a major upgrade of uh, George Street and Port Chalmers. 
1998 was the last time that, that, that our main street got any, any love and it is looking pretty sad right now. Um, I won't go into what, how it looks sad, but it would be great to revitalise and uh, to um, upgrade many of, well, the buildings, work with uh, owners of buildings and to uh, just get something done with the sidewalks, with the plantings, because uh, you know Port Chalmers is the gateway for all those um, hordes that come off the cruise ships, 238,000 of them last year, uh, not to mention <coughs> other tourists from, uh, from around New Zealand and around um, our beautiful country. So we're looking at that, and we'll, I'll, we'll come back with uh, more comprehensive requests later on this year. Um, next up, uh, the uh, climate mitigation for Aramoana, for Long Beach and for Purukau Nui really needs to be on everybody's radar. There's been sig significant flooding at Long Beach, Aramoana and uh, Purukau Nui in the last three, four years. We need to also <coughs> see some uh, action on the sea walls from Port Chalmers to Aramoana. And I'm sure that once we're done with the peninsula, that you know, you'll be coming out there to do that. And I look forward, we look forward to working with a roading on that. Uh, oh, toilets, 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 toilets. Uh, there are at least two that we need. Uh, St. Leonard's definitely needs one. Uh, now that the shared path is being completed, which is absolutely wonderful. I forgot to mention that in my thank yous. Um, and uh, Purakau Nui also needs a toilet uh, quite badly. I think that's me. Yep. Oh, there is one other thing with our main street and we're, that we're having a difficulty with right now, and that is uh, cruise ship um, workers gathering around uh, the town hall, the library, because that's where the free Wi-Fi comes from, the library, uh, smoking and dropping rubbish and generally glittering up the place. So we'd like to work with council and and the cruise ships and Port Otago to do something about that. We don't know what yet. It's a very new issue. So yes, that's me, ready for questions. Thanks, friend. You have to take questions. Mm? You're happy to take questions? Absolutely. I hope I can answer them. But yeah. <laughs> Councillor Hillahan. Kia ora. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, I agree. There definitely needs to be a toilet at the, by the yacht club there in St Leonard's because everyone seems to just go at the yacht club. But anyway, um, where there's not a toilet. Uh, that area um, from in St Leonard's where people cross the road to go to um, onto that walk on and off it. I don't know whether the board's got that on its agenda or putting it in the annual plan for consideration, but um, something that has been raised quite a bit with from residents um, to me is the speed, because at the moment it's 80, but it has slowed down a bit with the cycleway work that's happening at the moment, but it would be good if that could be lowered to 50 um, or something like that to make it safer for people who cross there all the time to go onto the cycle walk lane. So I don't know whether that's something that the community board is looking at or not, but... Well, that's uh, the state highway, so NZTA is doing that, and uh, they did bring, when they brought the plans to us, there is going to be something, there's going to be really, uh, median barrier there, I think. Right, but and it is something the community board could lobby on, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. we have. Oh, great. Yeah, in the past. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before my time, that was. Right. But I've, I've got it on my radar now, Carmen. Great, thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, yes, Francisca, thank you for your presentation, and thank you for taking on the responsibility of representing by far the coolest and funkiest part of our city. Um, <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, one related, there was a lot of um, front page news over the last year related to the noise emanating from the new Rio class ships. Could you give an, uh, us an update on what has happened there? And yes, I could, and it's only good news. Um, 
Maersk and Port Otago worked together and they've been doing so for a year. Uh, mufflers have been fitted to the Rios and they are not making any noise anymore, which is completely spectacular because I could hear them at my house, which is on the other side of that hill. But it does, no buts, it does highlight though of the, <laughs> the noisy ships now. The ships that weren't noisy before the Rios came are now noisy, but Port Otago is also working with that. So yes, yay. Uh, I think it's an awesome, positive outcome from Port Otago. Excellent, and that's, that's, that's great news and testament to the, the board's work uh, rectifying that problem. Second question is, human beings are a very fickle breed um, and for many years they've uh, railed against the inactivity of the completion of the cycleway to Port Chalmers. Now that that's going ahead, have there been any similar situations as has emanated on the peninsula related to people uh, now being peeved about any aspects of the completion? Or is it just all upside Not and wonderment? Ups upside and wonderment. And nobody has stopped me in the street to whinge at me, so that's all good. I'm very lucky. Um, yes, no, I think people have realised that I don't, that please don't whinge. I just turn into Pollyanna as soon as they start, so maybe that's what the rest of us need to do. And final question, anticipated timeline on that completion? That is 2022. Okay. From outside the community board area, Councillor Barker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, kia ora, Francesca. Um, may I ask, with the growth in crews, because obviously that has grown exp exponentially, um, are there any more safety issues that you've noticed occurring with people? Obviously, they look the wrong way to cross the road because a lot of them are from um, out of the city. Have you noticed any of that occurring? Are there any issues from crews? Uh, around? Yeah, like obviously there's been a big increase. Has the, um, the area... Yeah, there's you people. Anything, or are you quite happy with what's occurring there? Um, well, Port Otago has um, moved across walk, mm. and so people can uh, go up to the museum and come across at the uh, across to the library. And people don't do what locals do and wander across the street, mostly. Um, I'm actually glad you said that because there was there is some, uh, there is an issue from uh, some people in Aramawana regarding the uh, there have been. Um, uh, large tour buses going out to Atamoana on the road and uh, it's just a matter of time. I'm just bringing this to people's attention. It's just a matter of time before someone ends up in the yeah. harbour because the buses, there's three three corners, three blind corners where they, they can't fit round the corners and they go, they uh, take up at least half of the, of the oncoming lane. Are these local operators going out there? They are local operators and the, the board is, uh, I'm asking the board next week, mm -hmm. To, that we write a letter to the companies asking them to use smaller buses. And hopefully that can happen because that's um, a transport issue and uh, making, <clears throat> changing load limits is a very big thing. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. Francisca, thanks for coming. Um, some of the stuff you asked for, again, I'm sort of just gonna go back to the community plan development and how it fits into the long-term plan. Um, uh, are you aware, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the main street of Port Chalmers is one of the community upgrades that's already sitting in the long-term plan? Yes, we've been asking for it for a wee while now, so, yes. Um, I'm feeling it is there though, isn't it? Port Chalmers? Okay, but there are placeholders because we had this discussion about because I think this gets to the issue of the community plans is that if you have a request like that and we have that in our long term plan we've got to make sure that the community boards and the staff are integrating oh, their, absolutely. their conversation and so it's so it's sitting there as a placeholder and then you can go back to your community and say actually it's sitting there for this year when we have uh, at next week at our meeting I think we're going, we're going to have a good chat about this and how to go about getting consultation happening with both council staff especially and, thing, uh, and the community. Especially things like the seawall to the road to Aruana. Yes. I think there's going to have to be a number put in that request so we understand exactly what we're facing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. A number. How many million dollars yes, will it I cost know. to yep. build that seawall? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Fran. Thank you. 
And last, but by no means least, Mr. Morrison, welcome. Slowly working our way north. Five minutes is not a lot of time, so we'll make a start, and my time starts now. Firstly, a request to bring forward some expenditure. You may be aware that the reticulated freshwater systems in Waitati and Warrington are low-pressure systems, and the dwellings are on restricted water supplies. There's not enough pressure in the water mains to adequately supply the needs of fire appliances when they attend a fire. And you may have seen in the ODT that we had a nasty fire in Warrington three weeks ago which was attended by four appliances, two water tankers, and a lot of local helpers. And it was only the fact that the local school swimming pool was still full that provided enough water to be able to extinguish the fire via portable pumps and save a number of houses which would otherwise have been lost. A couple of years ago, we had a nasty fire in Waitati that was only safe from spreading because we had three days of rain leading up to the event. The building itself on that occasion was a total loss. We've been in discussion with Three Waters for some time regarding the provision of substantial water tanks in Waitati and Warrington to give support to the fire service and give some resilience. Three Waters staff have designed these facilities and the cost has been advised as $80,000 with an installation date of next year. I would ask that consideration is given to bringing this forward to the present financial year. You're involved in two high-profile topics with other agencies. One relates to getting people out of cars and into buses. Currently, there are no weekend services, no weekend bus services to our north coast area, nor are there any services in the evenings, in spite of the fact that the distance from Dunedin CBD to Waitati is about the same as from the CBD to Portobello, which does have an adequate bus service. We've been discussing this with ORC and we've provided them with a draft requested bus timetable. And we would ask that you support our request to them for a much improved bus service. You appear to be keen to work with other agencies towards the creation of a cycleway between Omaru and Dunedin. We support this and much of it will pass through our North Coast area. So please do not ignore us once discussions get underway. We have a lot of knowledge in our area which can contribute to the successful provision of such a scheme and we would be keen to receive a visit from appropriate staff at any forthcoming community board meeting. And while we're at the north end, there is a Dunedin sign in a paddock just south of Flag Swamp School. But the first sign of habitation for visitors is when they arrive at the main street of Waikawaiti. The main road is in real need of a spruce up to give visitors a favourable impression of the northern gateway to the city. And we would appreciate it if the urban design team could come along to one of our meetings in the near future for discussions on making a start on this. For the past few years, we've been promised that the final capping of the Waikowiti landfill will happen this year. But that was last year and the previous one and the current one, but still no sign of progress. We need to get this done so that our enthusiastic team of volunteers can make some real progress with the development of the new recycling centre. I understand that funding is in the budget, so please make it happen this year. We note that a new road maintenance contract has been let for the coming 10 years, and we will be keen to see this new contract providing improved maintenance of rural roads and ditches and greater attention paid to overhanging vegetation. The Blue Skin Show in Waitati will be held on Sunday the 5th of April and we always have a city council and community board stand there with information to assist the public with upcoming consultations and we always have the, the mayor attending and planning staff and councillors and you're all really most welcome to come along and please bring the children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, they will have a ball. And lastly, I have a sheet here for you that uh, the GSOs will hand out, just with bullet points of what I'm talking about. But I've also included a comment that was posted on the CamperMate app 
by a Dunedin resident thanking DCC for all that we have done to make Warrington a successful freedom camping area. The comment was posted on the 5th of December and it says, Thank you DCC, what a great camp. You have understood the needs of freedom campers and the provision of toilets, a dump site, water and plenty of rubbish bins is greatly appreciated and therefore used responsibly. We are from Dunedin and are happy to see our rates being used to keep Dunedin beautiful by recognising that people will free camp and if you provide for them, they will respect the place. And this reinforces what we've been saying for some time now. And my five minutes is up, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Alistair. Just first thing on the subject of bus timetables, as, as you're aware, that's governed by the Regional Council, but they are, a bit, they are set to review imminently their Regional Public Transport Plan now. Correct. We will be actively involved in submitting on that, and I would welcome input from the community boards in particular around um, what would work in those areas. So we'll definitely be in touch as yeah. that progresses. Our next stage with this is the, the plan we put together. This followed a lot of consultation. We've got an enthusiastic team on our board now, and we've got some new members. And uh, in each of the different areas, people have been via social media asking, what do you want in the way of buses? And simple things like being able to go to town, to the movies, to a concert, to the football, and to be able to go out in the evenings, simple things, that's what they're asking for. And being able to get a bus into town in time for work, and to be able to get a bus home after work. It's not difficult, so we put it all together, we're going to sit with the ORC and refine it, you know, to see which kind of bus best times will actually suit best. And then we'll be putting it to you when we come to sit down a wee bit later on this year with the regional public transport plan. Great, look forward to it. Uh, questions? Councillor O'Malley. Just my community plan question again. Um, in this instance, um, you've mentioned the main street of Waikowaiti, and I know that when we've looked at um, smaller communities for upgrades, we don't have the list of our rural communities in that list at the moment. So will you be putting into your community plan that in fact those townships also be considered because we've got, you know, I'm just top of my, um, Outram, Middle March, Brighton would also be sitting. Uh, on very that. much so. Now that we've got this new format uh, that Sandy Graham and our team have put together for community plans, then we are going to be very much focused on uh, identifying all these items. And then we'll come and talk to you about them at a later date and hopefully get more than five minutes to do it. Can't make any promises. Councillor, oh, no. Councillor Elder. Um, I note my husband went and helped someone clear a section of trees um, so that they could build a house and he noted that um, these outlying communities are actually getting bigger and bigger because one, there's not that much land supply in town but two, your area is rather attractive. So have you noticed um, that, um, you know, Waitati, Warrington have grown a lot? Right now, there are 35 uh, sections being built upon in Warrington, which is about a 30% increase in the population of Warrington. Mm. We are talking to transportation and taking them for a ride just to look at the roads. People are concerned about not roading speed when they're finished, but also all the construction vehicles that are putting this together. And so 30% increase in any village is a lot. Mm. And it, it's not just roads. It's a whole heap of other things. We want to know if the sewage system can cope with it. We want to know if the reticulated water can, can cope with it as well. And as we go along with the sea level rise, climate changing thing, we've got this issue in Warrington where the actual settling ponds for the sewage is on Warrington spit, which changes shape. So the whole idea of increasing population has got many ramifications. So is that the case in Waikowaiti as well? There's more building going there, on? There's there. more room for building in Waikowaiti. Waikowaiti is a fairly stable place, but the, the, it's a very desirable place. There are a number of retirees, but there is an awful lot of industry developing there. So yes, it's going to be an, in, an increasing area all the way through. So therefore, um, a, 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 a better public transport system... Oh, very much so. We don't have a public transport system right now. <laughs> what we have is a joke. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Appreciate that. Do enjoy the rest of your day and your deliberations. It's 10.30. I'll move that we adjourn for morning tea. Second, Councillor Staines.
All those in favour? Uh, that's agreed. We'll be back at quarter to 11. Thank you. Quarter to 11. Welcome back, everybody. Mr Christie. Item 18, economic development. Mr Liggett. Welcome. Do you have any comments to make? Are you happy to take the report as read? Uh, happy to take the report as read and go to questions, yep. Your Worship. That's fine. Questions, councillors? Councillor Barker. Good morning. Uh, we've listened to the community boards this morning talking about some of the effects that visitors have on their areas, including around um, gateways, signage, plus the effects on the um, infrastructure and environment. I'm just wondering if within your budget, if there's an allowance for visitor research, obviously we can't manage what we can't measure, and then also destination management. An example that I'll give um, is the peninsula map on the Portsmouth Drive, and we've been having inquiries about that's in a, in a bad state, and no departments kind of own it. There's nothing in the budget to fix it up. So I wonder whether you're responsible for that, if it's in your budget, and is there a plan for the future for that? Um, yeah, thank you for that. Questions that I guess you've got in there to answer the one around the map. Uh, we have started some internal discussions as to discussing that further with the community board and others to ensure that we get a good outcome um, regarding what type of signage we'd want at the start of the peninsula. Uh, so I think that work is underway and we're always keen, um, you know, with the likes of uh, coming in from the northern motorway into the city uh, for any particular items that community boards or councillors might want us to undertake in terms of our work programme. So we can always look at that and incorporate it where we can in that programme. Um, with respect to the research, we're always a, a, a big advocate for good research, and I did note uh, the community board's desire to see some research on the peninsula, and we'll be talking through with our team how we might be able to undertake that research and to ensure that we can get good data to, to manage the demands that are on the peninsula in particular. So uh, we'll refer that back to our city marketing manager and the team to see whether or not they can incorporate that in their, their work programme as well. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, Mr Christie, um, every year through the long-term plan and annual plan, we sort of address the issue of city marketing um, and especially uh, promoting the city, international <laughs> air routes, uh, promoting... We've increasingly um, looked at how we can use our budget as wisely as we can into that east coast of Australian market. We are working actively with um, other players in that market, including Dunedin Airport, um, Tourism New Zealand and others. So you can always do more with more funding, but we're at the moment really looking at how we can work with local operators, work with other partners to ensure that the money that the ratepayers are putting in um, is used to best effect, and measuring the return on that in terms of what that's meaning uh, with visitor numbers out of um, particularly the east coast of Australia. Uh, so it's a difficult one. We can always do more. Um, it is a very greedy market in terms of how much you need to invest in it to get the sorts of returns that we like as a city. Uh, so we are looking at other ways that we can piggyback off um, visitors coming in via other routes as well, whether that's Christchurch or Queenstown airports, by, by linking in touring routes across uh, particularly the lower half of the South Island. Um, so we're leveraging it wherever we can, Councillor, and if there was additional funding, we would, we would still look to grow those partnerships where we can. Okay. Um, slightly different tack um, and more recent and current events. Coronavirus, Tourism New Zealand, um, you know, already, what, 20% down on... Um, all Chinese group packages uh, being cancelled, things like that. Um, have you had much discussion within the office and about impacts for the city? 
Uh, yeah, we're obviously keeping quite a close watch on that. The group tour market is the one that's being hit um, the hardest. And interestingly, the group tour market has reduced out of China over the last few years, so it now accounts for about a third of our Chinese visitors. Uh, we're still concerned that the impact that might have on our local operators, and you know, we are watching to see how great that effect will be. And working with um, national bodies such as Tourism New Zealand and others um, to do what we can to, to ensure that good, accurate information is put out to, to our local community. Um, Education is the other side where we're keeping a really close watch on it. We have a number of students that come internationally and in particular from China. A uh, number sits so currently around 800 and we know that the high schools and the tertiary institutes are working really hard with the Ministry of Education to ensure um, the, the, any potential impact there is minimised where possible. Councillor Lord. Yeah, John, I just um, had a couple of questions. The first one, just to follow on actually from Councillor Wiley's question relating to the to the airport, and you said that you um, lever off other ways that you might get people into the city, i.e. Christchurch and Queenstown. Um, and, and I'm just sort of asking your profes professional opinion here as opposed to a, a political decision that we as a council might make, but do you believe that um, we as the owners of the airport, or part owners at least, 50% owners of the airport should focus more on what comes through Dunedin Airport, say, or, or should we focus on just what comes into the city and not worry where it comes from, as in the other routes you mentioned? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I mean, we're, we're fully committed to using the funding we've got to promote into Australia to support the the route that we have, um, Trans-Tasman route that we have with Brisbane, the Brisbane service, which is uh, obviously beneficial to Dunedin Airport as well. We can't ignore that Australian travellers do come in via other ports. They come in via Queenstown, uh, they come in via Christchurch, and they come in via, via Auckland. Um, and when they're in our region, we want to make sure that they spend as long as they can visiting our city, um, visiting our operator attractions, and uh, spending as long and as much money as they can here, which is the ultimate game. Um, so we've kind of got a mix, a, a bit of both of that, and you know, whilst we're fully committed to you know, ensuring that we are marketing direct into Australia for Dunedin, uh, we also do look at other opportunities to partner with bodies around New Zealand to ensure that if they are coming into New Zealand, that we at least get them to come here as well. Yep. Thank you. And the other question related, like um, sort of the last year or two, we've had the Martin Jenkins report, and out of that there was a degree of um, perhaps dissatisfaction with some things, and you have um, moved on with the recommendations and got a new city manager or marketing manager for the city, and I just wondered how that's working out, and do you feel you're having good buy-in uh, with the people that were previously perhaps less than excited with your work or your department's work? Yeah, look, certainly around the city marketing uh, engagement with operators, I believe we've made some really good inroads. Uh, city marketing manager is one of those. Uh, we've also started a, an advisory group called Visit Dunedin, uh, which has a number of stakeholders on it, and they're coming together regularly to discuss issues that are of um, common interest to the sector. And I believe that, along with um, some ongoing relationship building, things are in a much better state. Councillor Vandervis. I'm looking at your um, expenditure budget on page 225 and I'm wondering of the more than $6 million that you manage to spend every year, um, what part of that budget actually is your advertising? Is it operations and maintenance? Is it consumables? Uh, obviously it's not internal charges which are also enormous at over a million dollars. Do you believe that you're getting value for the internal charges at over a million dollars worth per year? Uh, look, I, I can't answer that. The internal charges are set um, across the whole organisation. Okay. So your advertising budget comes out of which? Um, operations or consumables in general? Uh, it'll be coming out of a combination of both, but mostly out of operations, and the figure sits at close to a million dollars, 990,000 approximately. So, sorry, out of operations and maintenance, it's close to a million for advertising? That's correct. Uh, yes, marketing. 
right. which includes advertising. A lot of the marketing we do now is online, so it's not direct marketing as you or advertising as you would normally view it. Okay, so given that most of your um, 1.8 million uh, of proposed um, operations and maintenance is marketing, what what would the other 800,000 be? Um, yeah, a lot of that is in either personnel or direct marketing costs. But personnel so costs, costs are separate and they're uh, more than two and a half million, which I, I find amazing as well. How many? I'd have to, sorry, we'd have to come back to you on that in terms of the maybe detail, you, but it'll be around. Maybe if you give me a breakdown. Yeah, um, be around projects, councillor, so, you know, each of the projects that we run have an associated budget with them. Right. Uh, so I'd imagine that uh, that, whilst those figures have been agglomerated, a lot of that will be the project budgets that staff members um, have per their portfolio. Okay, so, so you'll be able to give me a breakdown of operations and maintenance, consumables and general and also internal charges. Yes. Right, thank you very much. Councillor Houlihan. A bit cluttered here, hard to get to my speaker. Um, hi, thanks for that. I'm just wanting to know, um, uh, uh, have we got a strategy around marketing for tourism to maybe look at more regional, you know, so including that whole Otago area? Is that something we're moving into a little bit more or not really, or I just wondered? Yeah, I might let Mr Liggett talk a little bit about the Otago Regional Economic Development Framework, which um, mm. talks about the region's interest in marketing. Thank you very much, Mr Christie. Um, <laughs> so, um, probably towards the end of last year, uh, the, uh, the councils across Otago came together, started looking at economic development opportunities, where effectively uh, the whole was always going to be greater than the sum of the parts. So, yeah. focusing on those areas where, as councils, we had common interest. Uh, that came together as something called the Otago Regional Economic Development Framework. Mm. And it's got a series of themes within there, uh, yeah. which are focused around collaborative working across the region. So that was endorsed uh, by the councils at the end of last year, and we're moving into an implementation phase. Uh, as part of that, uh, the Provincial Growth Fund has also supported the appointment of advisors along the coastal along coastal Otago mm. and one inland and certainly one of those areas um, in terms of wider marketing and opportunities associated there with that will be unpacked. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we get more numbers, you know, yeah. marketing together because often they say that old saying about car sales yards, you know, you go to buy a car where all the cars are. So mm. if you're marketing in with a whole bigger region, maybe it might you know, might help perhaps, yeah. Certainly the intention of the framework is to, make, is to provide an opportunity for those debates. Mm. Do we know what type of tourist we get coming to Dunedin? Because it's probably a different person who travels to Dunedin than would go to Queenstown, but that's just my assumption, I don't know. Equally, I'll take great pleasure passing back to Mr Christie yeah. on that one as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, we do have some data around that, and it differs mm -hmm. um, depending on whether you're talking about international visitors or domestic, so mm -hmm. um, we will report that back through our normal reporting to committee, and right. you'll get a chance to, to explore some of that data a little bit more. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. Thank you. I had one more question. Um, with the businesses, um, particularly along George Street, quite a few of them have raised concerns about obviously we need to do this infrastructure work and that'll be part of economic development is involved in, in some of that, obviously with the businesses and things. Um, it, no one's denying the work doesn't need to be done, but is there anything we can do and is there anything in the budget to help businesses during that time, because some of them are really concerned um, about their, you know, their financial viability, quite frankly, while the work's being done, and I can understand their concerns. I can also understand that we have financial constraints on us as a council, but is there anything in our budgets coming up that we can do to help there? Uh, we don't have anything within our budget, so I think the wider work may be considering uh, what they can do around um, 
encouraging people to use those spaces as the main street's being redeveloped. So that's it's early days, there's a lot more planning mm. to go into that yet, mm. and I guess that'll be incorporated in the overall planning work that will be um, undertaken shortly. Are we looking at other centres and how they've you know, react like how they've worked alongside business to help in those situations? Yeah, look, absolutely, and, and the ideal outcome around New Zealand, um, is there any um, way we could actually increase that funding or what's your, your um, thoughts around that um, work? Uh, look, um, we also believe we're getting the good traction is occurring within the city regarding uh, startup activity. Um, it's always a question around um, investment. We, we're fairly Council will invest in a number of activities through the Startup Dunedin Trust. Yes. So there's some core activities such as co-starters and activities that we look at. We support uh, the Challenger Series and Audacious. So we think we've got a good mix of activities that we are actually funding within there. Cool. There's also some other things that will be coming into the startup ecosystem uh, in the short term, which is around code, Centre of Digital Excellence, which actually picks up on many of those business startups and scale up sort of issues. So uh, we just want to probably get code up and established and understand the level of investment that will be coming through that and the activities that it will be funding probably before and we can review after that in terms of any other choices in there. The startup ecosystem is very, very oh. happy for your funding and it's, it's going really well. So thank you. Thank you for that. You. Um, with the e regional economic um, framework, um, is there any pieces of work coming out of that which you see could yep. um, do with funding or support of some sort or another? Look, we're, um, at the moment with the framework we're in the identification of what those potential initiatives could look like. Uh, it's probably too early in that sense to actually be talking about specific levels of investment within there and those activities itself. Um, part of it is moving from we have a, we have a book, we have a framework, we have some good intent, but we actually need to get some of the projects up and going. And some of those will be, those projects, some of those projects may be existing ones, but we just pull a bit tighter together. So it's possibly a little bit too early to be having an immediate discussion around probably the investment at this so point. So uh, just a bit, uh, get more consolidation of um, streams of work. Correct. Um, if we identify something that um, may need some additional support, we, we would consider that at the point in time within there. It's probably just worth noting there too for all councillors that that framework is well supported by various government departments, oh, cool. uh, MB in particular, and uh, this, this work was funded through the Provincial Growth Fund as a way to ensure that any future funding decrease, is there, what, is there any concerns about that or has it gone, gone to some other place, you know, how's the work going in that place? Sorry, do you want to find Yeah, I was sorry, I was just, just conferring with my colleague. Um, there was actually just a reduction uh, by Education New Zealand funding for a specific project. We have subsequently um, been awarded investment by ENZ for another project. So the reduction oh. was basically a time-bound investment uh, by Education New Zealand that had come to its conclusion within there. Uh, we've subsequently received other investment for Education New Zealand uh, for a transitions program. So um, a smaller investment, um, but um, it was basically just a time-bound initiative within there, which is we're working with the study to need and partners to mainstream. Oh, good. Good, excellent. And um, the, the last question was just about um, the Dunedin Partnership and going to Chamber of Commerce. How's that working? 
Uh, look, that's working particularly well. We think that uh, this region is well served by having one provider delivering that service and we're working with them to ensure that we're streamlining other programs of work, um, such as the um, taking startup companies through into, into a growth phase and, and into the Callaghan grants and innovation um, side of the, the grant funding that they have. Uh, so we, you know, we see that working particularly well for the region. So um, that partnership with the Chamber of Commerce is working well? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. Oh, cool, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, just I'm looking at your income statement, and the Centre for Digital Excellence, um, does that not show up on our income statement? Uh, no, it does not. <laughs> OK. Because, you know, obviously, your external revenue doesn't have 10 million in it. So, so we just administer that. That goes to a third party, does it? Uh, that will be correct. <laughs> uh, we uh, we haven't included that within the uh, some of the statements. Then, as per the business case for the Centre of Digital Excellence, uh, there's an expectation of creating a third party de third party entity, a legal entity for code, uh, where the, um, the funding effectively will be novated or passed over right. by that entity. Okay. That makes sense. And then I get again to your expenditure. There's zero in the grants and subsidies column or row. Um, and yet I think, aren't we handing out grants and administering grants? So No, we don't. To Councillor Elder's question and your answer then, are we supporting that stuff monetarily? Um, we've got service level agreements with those organisations, but it's not a grant program. Okay. Cool. Well, then maybe, should we be considering, do we have a role in economic development. I have a feeling we tend to look at the economic development unit and think of it more as an RTO and forget that it's got these other activities. Uh, well, off, okay, 80% of the questions that tend to come towards the economic development unit tend to be about its tourism component. And then we obviously have the other components of you know, manufacturing, technology, all these other such things. Should we be considering potentially us as a group, what role the economic development unit might play in those other aspects and whether or not grants and subsidies should in fact be a component of that behaviour. Uh, that would be a decision of council. Yes, obviously. Thank you. That's a rhetorical question. Yeah, and I would remi remind councillors that, that the answer to any question that starts with could we increase resourcing to X or Y is uh, yes, but those are decisions for this body to make and not staff um, who I'm sure could find ways of spending whatever resourcing was allocated to the respective departments. Councillor Raddock. Yes, thank you. Um, so does the ED group have a set of KPIs, the simple KPIs that measure performance and so forth? Uh, yeah, we're developing those up. Uh, yes, we do, is the short answer, and we're continually reviewing those and developing them up around other programs of work that we have, the new programs of work, and happy to bring those along as part of our reporting back to Economic Development Committee to, sh to show you how we're performing against those KPIs. Yeah, well, certainly you've had some great successes lately, so you have a good time to instigate them and backdate them and show the, the rise, that would be good. And do we track economic performance across the city? Yes, we do, and um, we're looking to bring a annual report to uh, the next Economic Development Committee that shows where we're at economically. Great, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Just going back over what Councillor O'Malley said before around core, will we get to see, um, you know, the What's, what that money's being spent on, will that come to us somewhere through some budget? So, uh, through code? Yeah. Um, yep. Um, so while we'll be creating, while the business case is proposing the creation of a third party legal entity, mm. uh, we will have some part of involvement within that entity, uh, some role, uh, and there'll be, we are looking at a benefits realisation plan and reporting structure around there, which, yeah, we want to see. We want to uh, obviously. So we'll be, be able to see yep, what the we'll money's be been visible. spent yep. on, and yep, lovely. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Yeah, yes, thank you, Your Worship. And I don't want to be the purveyor of negativity here, but I guess my comment, stroke, question emanates from questions that were posed by Councillor Vandervis and Councillor O'Malley and others, and particularly as a new, a newly elected member. Um, to me, this report didn't tell me anything and I think unlike if you look through everything else we've gotten during this process um, the other reports give a fairly insightful overview of departments um, including function aspirations and goals and I just I'd expect as a as a as a member of the governance team 
uh, just to have more information around the department with a $6.5 million budget. So, do you have any comments around that? Uh, look, we can look to bring that detail, level of detail to council. Thank you, and noted. So I wanted to move the recommendations, or otherwise, moved Councillor Staines, seconded Councillor O'Malley, would you like to speak to it, sir? Further speakers? Councillor O'Malley. Um, because I couldn't bring up it because it wasn't a question. Um, I happened to be at a meeting Appreciate last it. night um, where the general manager of the airport was there and he was asked about flights to Melbourne and Sydney. Um, it was a tourism meeting. And um, he said, frankly, you won't get Melbourne and Sydney flights started until the Brisbane flight is fully working. But then he went on to say that the city marketing manager and the airport are working together in a, in a truly um, efficacious manner. And I have to commend your unit and the new manager, because that's the first time I've ever heard the, chair, the general manager of the airport say that. Um, and actually, just a commentary to the income statement and, and the expenditure statement. Given that the unit actually has a number of quite different activities, it would be quite good if we saw these statements broken down into the activity class in which you work in, so we have an understanding of where that money's going. Thanks. Councillor Elder. I just want to thank your department for all the hard work they've done on the Pro Provincial Growth Fund grants that they've had to follow up, which has taken an enormous amount of time. Same with the Regional Transport Plan. And I do a Regional Transport Plan, Regional um, t t Growth Plan. Um, and I also want to follow up with, from Jim that, in fact, um, indeed, Dunedin Host was singing the praises of Malcolm and Alexander and the team in working in the tourism space. So thanks for all your hard work and, uh, um, and congratulations on starting to get that feedback around um, that new structure and people in marketing. I'll put the motion. Oh, sorry, you're right of reply, sir. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against, that's agreed. Thank you, team. Now, we'll go back to item 11, reserves and recreational facilities, um, because we didn't uh, cover this off fully yesterday, pending further information from staff. And I guess my only question is, welcome back, Ms Graham, is would staff have any concern were council to be of a mind to remove uh, the fees set out for hiring of barbecues in our swimming pools? No concerns at all, Your Worship. Excellent. Well, I'll move that we remove that uh, from the schedule of fees and charges. Second, to Councillor Wiley. Um, anyone want to speak to it? No. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? Uh, that's agreed. And that being done, I'll move, as per the order paper, that Council uh, approve the relevant budgets and fees and charges schedule. Uh, for reserves and recreational facilities. Seconded, Councillor Elder. Any discussion? You all right? Uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? Thank you, Councillor Vanivers. Uh, that's agreed. Uh, item 19, governance and support services. Ms Graham and Mr Logie, welcome. Happy to take your report as read. Questions, councillors? Being none, I'll move uh, as per the order paper that these be uh, approved for the purposes of consultation. Seconded, Councillor Hall. Anyone wish to speak to it? Councillor Vanivers. Going through various budgets, the internal charges that uh, various parts of the DCC are subject to um, and governance and support services are a quite considerable part of this. These internal charges have uh, kept rising and have now got to what I consider to be eye-wateringly unjustifiable levels. Uh, in the case of Aratoi, um, uh, we have had, uh, I've, we've all had some detail uh, sent to us overnight and I've sent an email to you all recently uh, highlighting the fact that internal charges make up a very substantial part of any of the operations of DCC departments 
And in some cases, the internal charges seem to actually predominate. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit like the situation where some roadworks uh, have more uh, cost in the road cones and safety surrounding them than the actual roadworks themselves. Um, there doesn't seem to me to be any pushback at all on these increasing internal charges. Um, governance and support services, uh, BIS, which is, is the old IT um, uh, department for the DCC, uh, they're routinely sending out million dollar bills to various parts of the DCC for these services. Um, in private industry, you simply couldn't do anything like this. Uh, orders of magnitude away uh, from what I believe are actual real world costs. So um, I've, I've picked on governance and support services here uh, simply as an example but they carry through to all of the budgets that we've been looking at. And I think that we need to somehow uh, have some real world justification for these enormous uh, charges. Um, if our IT department is so expensive that it has to charge half a dozen different departments, millions of dollars, um, simply for being part of that service, uh, I think we need to somehow um, introduce some competitive um, uh, IT provision, uh, for instance. And similarly with uh, governance and support services, if the secretarial services are going to cost uh, in the region of millions of dollars for these d different uh, departments, I think we need to look at a, a different model because it's simply unaffordable to have charges at these levels basically means that your organisation is not sustainable. Um, we can talk about sustainability all we like, but if we don't practice it, uh, I think we have a serious problem. Uh, one of the main reasons that I have voted against a lot of the budgetary information that we have in this annual plan is simply because the uh, numbers are eye-wateringly large and I can't see how they're justifiable having run businesses of my own and being involved in quite large businesses overseas as well. Um, we should be running uh, the DCC in a more efficient manner. Um, to have draft budgets that are this enormous, uh, I, I think is, it's, I don't see how this council can actually um, put its hand on its heart and say, yes, we approve of these budgets, when in fact they re we really don't know how they arrived at, and especially with the enormous internal charges, how they can be justified. Um, if the Chief Executive would perhaps like to explain why it is that uh, all these different departments have you know, million dollar charges, uh, internal charges, which ratepayers end up paying for, um, I would like to hear it, or, or perhaps uh, we might get some uh, email uh, response later on. But I would really like some awareness of where all these millions are going and why. <coughs> Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor O'Malley. I think the assumption that when you look at internal charges that it is somehow is highly inflated statement. Um, makes the, the underlying statement there is obviously um, that there's a belief that there's inherent inefficiencies. Um, I think that we've gone through this as a fairly circular, society-wise we go through this in a circular arrangement. People believe that there's so much waste and then we go and we cut it all back and then we find there's no services and then we bring it all back again. Um, I highlight the Tauranga City Council as the one that has been, I think, flagged as the one that has the least number of staff per capita and it has one of the highest running costs because it contracts everything out. So we can save money by cutting our internal costs down and moving that expense to another column. But usually, when you add the two columns together, we haven't saved anything. In addition to which, a lot of internal charges are simply accounting charges to, to explain how it is that money's moving through the organisation. 
And so to say that that is an actual ratepayer cost is not necessarily accurate because as often as not it's simply an accounting treatment of how one department communicates with another. I really, I also would say that I probably cost the government supports budget a decent amount of money every year because when we have meetings, if I'm up at the Waikato Coast Community Board, we will leave with a series of requests of staff that goes through the government supports office. When I have, you know, when this stupid thing doesn't work, which is I'm frankly too often, I have to say, I start with my GSO and then move it through from there. If we don't have that support, that comes off as another form of inefficiency somewhere else. Um, I do not believe that this organisation is running internal, internally inefficiently. I do actually believe that we have an enormous amount of work to do and that we're going to have to pay for it. And the only way to pay for it is to, is to raise the money and do it. Councillor Reddick. Yes, uh, I've just got one comment on the uh, budget. And that is that there's a very large increase in the personnel costs, which comes entirely from rates revenue. So th the increase in personnel costs for the governance support and support department um, is com largely coming from the increase in rates revenue. So it's putting an extra million dollars on our <coughs> rates. So I would just like to hear um, uh, where that personnel is being deployed and a little bit more justification for that increase in the numbers. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I would like to respond to that as well. I agree with what um, Councillor O'Malley has said. And I think from a governance point of view, um, if all of us blocked every resolution we got here during these last few days, nothing would get done. You know, there has been, um, you know, obviously some councillors that have blocked many of these resolu resolutions, and I hear their concerns about budgetary issues. However, at some point, as a governance uh, council, we have to show confidence in our leadership and we've, we've got a team here of staff that do a fantastic job for our city. We've got a great city. Yes, there will be some issues where you could perhaps cut budgets. However, I've read so many articles about CEOs who come in, say, oh, the costs are too high, they slash and burn. The first often to go is the staff. And like Councillor O'Malley said, and I absolutely agree with him, you know, you end up seeing high costs in contracting. I don't think that's the answer. And yes, perhaps we could save some money on some of the budgets, but we also need to run a city. And I think, I think that our staff, our CEO and our management teams, our ELTs will do an excellent job. And I think as a governance, um, you know, councillors, we need to show them our support. And yes, if there are times things pop up that aren't perhaps adequate or we think there's a question, we can ask it. That's what we've been doing over these last two days, is we hold them to account by asking these questions. And they are under that scrutiny, and I think they do an excellent job. So I think that is our job as governance to show confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I'll take it by division. Councillor Benson Pope. <laughs> Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. <coughs> Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Fiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Carried 13 to 1. Thank you. Now, that was to be the final item, <clears throat> but uh, I've been made aware of a resolution from Councillor Benson Pope that, as far as I'm aware, isn't 
directly budgetary related. Well, so a bit like the matter I raised yesterday in terms of the street tree budget. I'm not asking for an allocation at the moment, but I would like, especially because of the comments that have been made by the, I mean, there is always pressure in these areas, as we know, but there have been comments made specifically by uh, two community board chairs, I think, this morning, uh, around issues and conversations that might or might not be happening. Uh, and I just think it will be... I, I, have, I have no information and I'm not aware of us having reported recently what the priorities are for um, improvement or installation of new facilities anywhere. I'd like to know that in the context of what's being asked so that we can make some rational decisions about it to ease the pressure um, when we come back to the, the, the wash-up. Um, any comment from the toilet czar? At this point? No. None. Do you, is there a seconder to the motion? Seconded Councillor Raddock? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> uh, further speakers? Councillor Raddock? Shall I go? Um, I think it's a really good idea to have a, uh, uh, to have a report with the list of priorities so that all the community boards and the public in general can see what the plan is and see just how what the lie of the land is. And similarly, we can then answer questions because inevitably it is a, uh, an item of uh, significant concern both to residents and visitors to the city. And so it's really helpful as a councillor to be informed of such things so we can answer those questions as we encounter them, as we've had several from the community boards, but also general members of the public, and in particular with the freedom camping going on. Uh, the whole freedom camping is quite a significant issue, so it'd be good to have a, uh, a prioritised plan. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, yeah, no, I'll be supporting this motion. The part that I'm sort of looking at at the moment is the construction of new public toilets. Um, when we look around the country, there's a lot of new technologies around public toilets and facilities. So um, in past, I've heard public to uh, construction of public toilet would be a, around $70,000, $80,000 proposition and, um, or more. And I think, uh, and I'm just thinking of Baldwin Street and what that cost. Uh, for example, so when I think of um, development of new public toilets, it would probably be more than the wording I would have liked. But I think the, um, we do have to look at greater opportunities of how the, we introduce new public toilets, the type of toilets, but there is definitely a need uh, to relieve that pressure. <laughs> we're, almost, we're almost there, people. Councillor Elder. <laughs> Um, I, I totally support this. So I've had a number of people across a number of communities really asking for this. And also there is a thing called the Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which actually is set up to, um, to actually address some of these issues. And locally, well, it, within the Otago region, there's actually a person in Cromwell doing some amazing work on toilets facilities at a reasonable price. So I think it's worth exploring and I <laughs> definitely support it and support for going outside funding as well. Councillor Barker. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate what uh, Councillor Elder <coughs> said. There are, uh, if we have a prioritisation plan for our loos, uh, we can apply for outside funding and obviously tourism and the amount of growth in visitor numbers it would be good to have their statistics, as we've talked about before, to support some of those applications. Thank you. Uh, I can support this because I think it would be helpful for the community to know what the plans are or if there aren't plans for doing things. And it's similar to the, the concerns we get from all over the district about uh, suburban centre upgrades and urban design improvements and people just don't know what is happening, if anything, and when it might happen and what and what our uh, list of, of priorities are. So I think that would be helpful um, regardless of whether what comes back is um, satisfactory to uh, the particular communities of interest. It's, I think it's helpful um, for people to be on, um, on the same page, as it were. Your right of reply, sir. Oh, just to... Um address the concern about cost. Um, 
I guess that's something we all want to hear about. I don't expect that this authority is going to try to compete with the uh, lavish facilities that have been built in the last year by the Gisborne District Council, uh, which cost a million dollars for four toilets. They're very nice though, beautiful artwork. <laughs> um, I have a photo if you'd like to see. <laughs> And that, <laughs> I'll put it, all those in favour? Thank you. Aye. Those against, that's agreed. That's it. Oh wait, sorry? Oh, <laughs> for, for those of you who are still in the building at quarter past 12, there'll be lunch uh, served in the Otaru room. The, uh, the efficiency of the meeting wasn't predicted by the catering department. Councillor Vanivis. Do we need an overarching resolution? No, the decisions I, I, made so far, recognising that we started out saying that they were subject to possible change. They are subject to possible change, but we haven't made, we haven't moved any amendments unless there's an operating, rev, unless there's a revenue line for swimming pool barbecues. We haven't moved anything that makes a, that makes an alteration to the draft annual plan budget, have we? I'm happy, I'm happy to reconfirm it. No? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a valid point. Councillor Raddick. And uh, I know we missed the question section on this last, this final resolution, and I just had a question about it. Could we include a little note, about uh, a little commentary in this report from staff on the concept of a, an art installation toilet? Because uh, Councillor Benson Pope talked about it. a million dollar job. They have a very famous one in Kawakawa. And we could have an equally famous one for much less expense right here in Dunedin that would also serve us from a tourist point of view. Oh, I would anticipate any staff report would canvas a wide range of options, Councillor. Don't panic. If there's nothing further, thank you everyone for your patience and efficiency over the past couple of days. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry. Ms Graham? Well, the meeting is closed. Councillors, if I could just um, let you know, you've asked for a number of reports for the meeting on the 11th, so the staff are working on those. They will be ready um, quite late on the 4th, so we will look to deliver them electronically on that evening. Um, we may not get physical, so for those that want paper copies, it may be that you need to, um, we'll need to arrange something for that. It's tricky with Waitangi Day as well, so just be aware that that's when it'll be coming out, um, but it's a short turnaround, so there's no opportunity of them being any earlier. Just, and there's two or three, I think.